Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, summer vacation is upon us, and many Americans will be traveling both domestically and internationally. Travel is a lot of fun. However, and unfortunately, it can also be linked to uh, transmission and exposure to different infectious diseases. Now, my guest today warns the public of five infectious diseases to keep an eye on during summer travel. So joining me on the show today is Luis Ostrowski, MD. Dr. Ostrowski is a professor of medicine and epidemiology and the chief of infectious diseases at UT Health Houston. Dr. Ostrowski, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, good to be here. Um, so what I wanted to do with this program is that I, I saw the press release and I saw your list. And I wanted you to share with the audience your list of five why your concerns, and probably most importantly, how to prevent. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the first one, which has been in the media quite a bit lately. And that, of course, is malaria, which is uh, affecting both of our states, Florida and Texas, mm -hmm. respectively. Um, first, can you talk, talk about what's going on with malaria here in the U.S.? And is that is that the reason you have this main concern? Yeah, so... Um... It's malaria is a very interesting disease. Um, malaria is one of the biggest killers of humankind. Uh, you know, the there's a really funny trivia question out there. They ask people what's the deadliest animal in the world, and most people say tigers or lions or you know orcas or whatever. And it's actually the mosquito. Uh, mosquitoes kill many more people than many of the animals we're concerned about. Malaria is a very severe disease, uh, multi-system disease that affects your whole organism, and it is transmitted by mosquitoes. It's a parasite, and it parasitizes your red blood cells and breaks them apart. So eventually, if you have a bad enough malaria, your red blood cells start breaking up, you end up with severe anemia, and this parasitic load keeps multiplying in your body, it starts affecting the liver, kidneys and if eventually your brain as well and you can die um, and again people are used to talking about malaria in tropical areas uh, africa latin america and very few people think about malaria in the united states um, and the reason for that is that we actually rarely see it here most of the time when we see it is in travelers or people who relocate from areas that had malaria uh, so all of us infectious diseases doctors in the U.S. are used to seeing, you know, people coming back home from Nigeria or another country and, you know, coming up to a hospital with malaria. But occasionally we do see malaria here in the U.S. For the most part, we call it airport malaria. And this is kind of a really interesting thing that happens is mosquitoes hitch a ride in a plane that's coming from one of those areas. And around airports or um, areas that have major international airports, we see very sporadic cases. And they usually don't transmit to other people. It's like a single case we'll see here in Houston, um, somebody that lives near, you know, George Bush Airport. Uh, but this alert from the CDC is important because it's telling us of locally acquired and transmitted malaria. So. Not, on, not anymore the single one-off, but a few cases in Florida and in Texas, which tells us that the vector, the mosquitoes here, and the vectors are infected with the parasite and transmitting. Um, so concerning, uh, probably not concerning enough that you should not go outside or do your normal life, but we do want people to be aware of this and um, practice precautions when you're outdoors, particularly after sundown, with repellent, basically, is what you need to do. Um, the other reason for the alert is that, uh, again, we're experiencing this post-pandemic travel boom right now, where everybody's traveling this summer, going weird and exotic places. And again, we want people to have those discussions with their physician or travel medicine specialist as to where you're going and do you need protection for malaria, beyond just repellents, uh, because if you go to a highly endemic area, you can actually take medication to avoid getting infected. 
Right. So, so is your concern uh, equal between pe uh, people traveling to, say, Disney as and Nigeria? <laughs> Yeah, so again, we don't have evidence that it is systematically transmitting in Florida. We just have this report of uh, a handful of cases. It's a good idea, again, always to do repellents, long sleeves, yeah. etc. Because aside from malaria, we have other mosquito-borne illnesses uh, in Florida and in the United States, like hmm. West Nile and every so often encephalitis and other things. So my advice is always you know if you're going to be outdoors um, in the summertime it's a good idea to wear repellent yeah all right the the second one on your list is measles and, and not a surprise highly highly contagious and it is frequently linked to international travel for people in the u.s um can you talk about your concern with measles and travel mm -hmm. and what can travelers do to protect themselves Absolutely. So measles is perhaps among all infectious diseases, the most contagious one. All it really takes to get measles is to not be immune to it and be in the general room with somebody with measles. I mean, it's that contagious. So if you're in a theater and somebody has measles and you're susceptible to it, you're going to get it um, just really by passing almost. So, um, What's happening here is very unfortunate. The issue is that we're having lower vaccination rates against measles for um, people in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy uh, mounting up. And we also have a phenomenon where there's a certain group that's very vulnerable, which are young adults who may not have received their measles vaccines when they were uh, younger because, again, this problem with um, vaccine hesitancy, or maybe having winning immunity as well. Mm -hmm. And when you couple that with going abroad, and there's places abroad that have incredibly low vaccination rates, and they are actually having measles outbreaks. Um, so you put a susceptible person in a high sort of contagious environment, and that's a perfect setting to get missiles abroad and bring it back home and infect a bunch of other people that are susceptible to it. So, you know, we've read um, about little outbreaks happening here and there in very close-knit communities. And um, again, CDC is anticipating a, a travel boom this summer and just reminding people that measles is a vaccine preventable disease. We have extraordinary vaccines for measles. And what we recommend is if you're not immunized for measles uh, or if you have low immunity tires, um, to just go ahead and get vaccinated. Yeah, yeah, the, the vaccine is key mm -hmm. with that with that disease. Uh, the, the third one that you mentioned, um, Dr. Ostrowski, and this, this is the only one that really surprised me, was mpox or monkeypox, which is really you know tanked over the past mm -hmm. you know several months. But I, I know there's a it's popping up again a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, why, why are you so concerned about it? Because, I mean, does it essentially is affecting certain populations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you recall, we experienced um, basically what ended up being a worldwide outbreak of MPOX last year in the summer, in, in um, July and August time frame. Yeah. And we were able to recognize it right away and vaccines started to be distributed immediately. Uh, this is one of the great um, sort of accomplishments of public health. We were able to uh, recognize the population at risk and vaccinate that population. And the outbreak nearly went away, not quite, you know, to zero, but it became from, for us, uh, from seeing, you know, a couple of cases per week to maybe a case every three months. So that's, that's how powerful the vaccination campaign was. Mm -hmm. And the concern is that the vaccine, again, may not be as durable as we thought it was. And also, uh, again, summer is the perfect time for travel and going to raves and parties in Ibiza and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you have unprotected sexual encounters, which is a route of transmission for this particular MPOX outbreak, uh, 
you have an increased risk of uh, of MPOX. So again, CDC released an alert saying, you know, we're concerned with summer travel and summer partying that we're going to see an uptick in the cases of MPOX as the vaccine efficacy is winning down or maybe people that were not reached with, with the vaccine, right? So again, this is a situation we are watching. We haven't really seen this uptick so far, but um, uh, something to keep an eye on. Yeah. And the best way not to get MPOX, um, if you're in the risk population, um, and again, this is primarily being transmitted currently in men who have sex with men or uh, multiple sexual partners, is to get vaccinated. So if you have HIV, if you have had um, multiple sexual encounters, uh, unprotected, uh, you're eligible to get mypox vaccines. And anybody who's taking HIV PrEP, for example, mm -hmm. would be eligible for an mypox vaccine. Okay, excellent. Um, the fourth one um, w was very interesting because this is probably the one that most of viewers may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. And that's um, fungal meningitis, something that's really hitting your state hard, right? Um, so I, I guess I would like to ask you to uh, give the audience an overview of the situation. What is this fungal meningitis? How are people getting it? And uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, so uh, CDC, um pretty much uh, got a tip from a physician working in the Texas-Mexico uh, border of a cluster of cases of meningitis in women who went to Matamoros, Mexico, uh, to get plastic surgery procedures and received epidural anesthesia. They were coming back and having meningitis that was testing negative for bacteria. They didn't know the etiology initially. Mm -hmm. And once CDC got involved and the Mexican authorities investigated as well, um, we realized that this is related to uh, most likely a fungus called Fusarium right. that um, uh, basically got into this epidural solutions uh, somehow and is introduced into the central nervous system through these epidurals and it infects the lining of the brain, which is the meningeal spaces. And this is a very, very severe life-threatening infection with a very high mortality. We read yesterday from CDC, we've uh, lost seven women so far to oh. this um, infection. We're monitoring nearly 200 women currently. Um, and this is just a reminder, uh, if nothing else, that if you're going to go abroad to have medical procedures, you need to make sure that these places are compliant with what you would see in the United States as far as quality of care. So you want to make sure that people are washing their hands, it's a clean environment, that medication are being dispensed by the hospital pharmacy, not just brought in, you know, by a doctor or an anesthesiologist, etc. So again, this is just a really, really strong reminder that having medical procedures abroad can go very wrong. And this is one complication, fungal meningitis, but we also see surgical side infections or infections with hepatitis and mm -hmm. HIV, et cetera, with blood transfusions. So again, um, summer is a great time to have elective surgical procedures uh, because you're off work, but do your due diligence and avoid places that seem a little bit, you know, out of the norm for what we would see here in the United States. And just a side note, um, mm -hmm. is since the word has gotten out, and I'm sure the people in Texas have heard, mm -hmm. heard about this pretty extensively, have, have we seen the numbers drop quite a, quite a bit or? Yeah, in fact, the, the, Two clinics that were implicated in this outbreak have been closed uh, yeah. for a couple of months now. So uh, we haven't seen newly acquired cases. We're still investigating cases that had an exposure up to the point where the clinics were closed. Mm -hmm. And because it's the fungal meningitis, is, is the incubation quite a bit longer than a Yeah, the incubation period can be up to two months. Yeah. So again, we're still following women that have 
procedures in those states. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. And the last one that you had on your list, um, COVID-19. Uh, can you talk about your concern with that? And, and the other question I have for you, are you suggesting that we've let our guards down? <laughs> so uh, the thing about COVID is that we're all really, really happy when we heard that the public health emergency was over. And a lot of the COVID policies and procedures were set aside. Um, but the reality is that COVID is still pretty much here. We're still seeing COVID cases in the hospitals every week. We still unfortunately see people dying from COVID-19. And although the incidence currently in the United States is probably at the lowest point since the pandemic hit us, um, we're still seeing cases and we're still, you know, losing people to it. So I do just want to emphasize that you need to not let your guard down, uh, be very careful, particularly if you're uh, immunocompromised, particularly if you're not vaccinated or have not had COVID to date. Uh, you probably will and still continue, you know, taking precautions when you're in large crowds and in public and sort of keep an eye on the ground uh, or any here on the ground. Um, again, the the incidence is very low right now, but if you start seeing the incidence going back up where you live or where you're traveling, you need to practice a precaution. I think the future state for us is we're going to be able to live with COVID uh, if we take it very seriously. Um, there's going to be a new uh, booster coming up in the fall that will cover the current um, variants in circulation. So I strongly recommend everybody get that booster. And again, if you start seeing up um, uptrends in the cases, then you need to start masking and be careful in public transport, etc. cetera. Uh, while the rates are up and then rates go down, you can go back to your normal life. So again, it's it's a, not a kind of a all or none situation with COVID. Mm -hmm. You just keep an eye on the incidents and act accordingly. Okay. Um, and, and lastly, uh, Dr. Ostrowski, any final thoughts on protecting the public from infectious diseases during travel? Yes. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, uh, there's a constant barrage of infections to be worried about. Um, I do want to tell people, you know, live your life and don't worry about every single cut and scrape or everything you eat. But just be aware that, you know, there are infectious diseases that you can acquire while you're traveling, while you're doing fun stuff. And uh, if you don't feel well, uh, don't just let it go. We right now have this kind of medical fatigue as to I'm done with everything, uh, but if you're not feeling well, if you're having fevers, diarrheas, rashes, go to the doctor, particularly if you travel, because there's, you know, infections that can be very serious and can be cured if treated early and can get very complicated if you don't seek medical attention right away. Yeah. And if you're going to particular international destinations, see a travel medicine clinic or a doctor? Yes, uh, every every city in the United States has travel medicine specialists and clinics. They're usually one-stop shops where you go and see the doctor or the nurse and they evaluate your personal risk for infections, for other complications like blood clots or, you know, any like altitude sickness, etc. And they uh, give you medication that you may need. They give you vaccines that you may need. So it's a worthwhile investment. If you're going to go on a big trip, particularly transcontinental, I would definitely go and visit a travel medicine clinic. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Luis Ostrowski, for sharing your time and expertise. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.